Customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you are a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Customer Service Revolution podcast with John DeJulius. The episode you're about to listen to is one John refers to as both the hardest and most important podcast he's recorded yet. This week, Chief Revolution Officer John DeJulius talks with Jason Reed, serial entrepreneur, author, Iron Man, and most of all, a great family man. In 2018, life could not get much better for Jason until he and his wife received the devastating news that their youngest son, Ryan, took his own life. Today, Jason is on a mission to reach every parent and every family about the conversations they need to be having with their kids. In this episode, you'll learn how depression in children and teenagers is at an all-time high today, that suicide was the second leading cause of death in kids ages 10 to 14, how teen depression is not prejudiced on who it affects, how as parents, You may know exactly what to do when your child falls physically ill, but for many, mental health is still an unknown. And to help our kids, we need more support than Google can provide. Many of us have no experience with depression or anxiety. What are the signs we should be looking for if our child is struggling with depression? What questions should we be asking? And most importantly, what you can do about it. Welcome your host for the Customer Service Revolution podcast, John DeJulius. Hello, revolutionaries, and welcome to another episode of the Customer Service Revolution podcast. I am John DeJulius, Chief Revolution Officer of the DeJulius Group. And today, if if you've listened to past podcasts, I always say how excited I am about you know the person I'm interviewing. Today is a little different. This may be the least excited interview I've ever done, but I believe the most important interview I've ever done. So to that, let's get to it. My longtime friend, Jason Reed. Welcome, Jason. Thanks, John. I am excited to see you, though. <laughs> always, always. Jason, where does this podcast find you? Well, I live in Southern California. Murrieta, and I'm in my office right now looking out at the golf course. Ah, nice, nice. I know you travel a lot. So uh, I'm just going to get to it. The backstory is, from what I know, and Jason, and, uh, correct me on what I have wrong and, and everything, but I think, you know, it's been about 15 years. I hate throwing us both under the bus, but I believe we met through Matt Stewart, which is, I think, hurt, hurt hurts our credibility a little bit, but... A little, slightly. <laughs> he's still he's still my business partner of thirty years. So I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we might have to get into you know that that judgment. But uh, and Jason, I, I feel like we're we're friends. We are. Yeah, and so the way I, I, I tell the story is, uh, you know, Matt brought me in into your business 15, 16, 17 years ago. I got to meet you. Then you've been so generous and and brought me to YPO and other events, and and so I got to know you. And so you know, kind of from afar. Jason Reed is this serial entrepreneur, started, has sold businesses, is a rock star in that Iron Man and, and just crazy decathlon, which, which you could explain a little bit more. But I got to know you, and every time I saw you, we connected, and it just wasn't from afar. And it's not just like one of these Facebook uh, relationships where everything looks perfect. I mean, you know, I know not you know, nothing ever is, but I, I've gotten to know you. We've, we've hung out. I've liked you. You know, I know your family has always been important. Everyone I know you has so much respect for you. And I've just really enjoyed getting to know you over the years. And uh, anything I kind of left out from that brief bio? Uh, I mean, John, that was very generous. I think I've had a 
a great life in many, many respects. I've had a very satisfying business life. I don't do a lot of fun things in my life. Been able to do. I've never been great at anything. Yeah, sure. I've done an Ironman, which people always leave out as I was like pretty much last every time I did them. I've written, you know, seven books. I like to tell, say I've sold eight, whereas you've actually written books that people read. I give mine away as doorstops. But I, I'm not afraid to try things. Yeah, yeah. And today you're you're doing so much more. And in my words, more significant than all that. And your resume is amazing. And you're someone that I looked up to and said, that's that's where I want to be. I want to be an incredible entrepreneur. I want to build businesses. I want to, you know, give employees opportunities. I want to be better in fitness and from all, uh, you know, purposes, your family's always been so important. It's always been something we've always talked about and you're just a great guy. So, but that that's the story from, from afar. The, the, the hard part of this story is, is kind of where we're going. The title of this podcast and your movie is, is uh, that you're making is, is what I wish my parents knew. Is, is that the correct title? Jeff? Yeah, it's uh, what I wish my parents knew. Yeah. So, you take it from here, Jay. You know you're you're, you're crushing it by all checklist or, or or whatever. You know, take us down the road. What happened several years ago? Thank you for all the kind words, John. I, I I appreciate our friendship and the times we spent together and all the things you do. I wish my companies could actually implement all the stuff that you you put out there as well as you guys have done. And I think that anyone who actually follows all of your stuff has an amazing company because you, your advice to people on customer service and how to run a company is just off the charts. So I really appreciate you and, and your family. You've been through a lot with your family as well. And you and I have bonded on some of that stuff and what you've done with your boys has been amazing. So in your life, and, and uh, I really admire you for that. So my story. So I usually play the trailer to the movie, tell my story which if you want to watch that is up on Amazon Prime. If you Google Tell My Story movie, you'll see it. And we'll um, have a link to all Jay's information they share in here in the show notes. And that'll be one of them, which is critical to uh, uh, people understanding the full complexity of, of, of your story. So I play the trailer is it's easier than telling the story. And, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you the story because um, it's, kind of relevant to what we're talking about, obviously. So back in March of 2018, my wife and I were in Mexico and we were having dinner and we were discussing how interesting our lives are now that the kids are getting older. Uh, Derek was out of the house and Ryan was just turning 14 and going into high school and he was our youngest of four and he'd literally turned 14, you know, a couple of weeks earlier and what was going to be next. And we were just having this wonderful conversation about how great our life was. And that night we got a text. We all got a text from Ryan. And they were goodbye texts. This is from your four, just a recently turned 14 year old. Yeah. And that night, Ryan took his life. Sorry. Don't apologize. You would think <clears throat> that after five years, it gets easier, but it really doesn't. So fast forward through the racing home and the him being in the hospital for four days and five days and finally having to take him off life support. Our lives changed forever. <clears throat> so I thought I had my whole life put together. That night in Mexico, I was planning out the fun stuff I was going to do with the next 25 years of my life. The back nine. The back nine. Excuse me. Instead, everything changed. 
After Ryan passed, I wanted to make a difference because that's what guys like Gus do, John, right? We try to take any tragedy and turn it into what we can turn it into. So I went out, I did a TED talk, TEDx talk right away. Did a goal cast, did another text talk, did the movie Tell My Story, where I tried to share with parents what I missed, what I wish I knew, and what I was hoping I could share with them. So because I didn't see it coming is really what it came down to, right? I knew Ryan was grumpy, but I had three other teenagers that were older and they were all grumpy. So I assumed they were just another grumpy teenager. Talking about mental health with our family never really happened. We didn't think it was a thing. But and Jay, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure like most, I'm sure like you, this doesn't happen to us, right? This happens in the movies. It happens to other people. But I love my children. I'm there for my children. Therefore, my logic was this couldn't possibly happen to you know, something has to be really dysfunctionally wrong, right? And so I thought, and and you know, knowing a little bit about your story, um, you know, it, 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 that's not that's not the case. Well, and that's what is interesting about this whole thing is that as you spend more time in this space, you realize that we all think this happens to people who, like, you know, you've got broken homes and, and dads that don't care or moms that don't care or dads that are on drugs and moms that are on drugs and parents that beat their kids. And, yes. and you think that these kids have reasons to be upset and sad and therefore they're going to take their lives or, or go down these bad paths. As you spend more time in this space, you realize that that's not exactly, it has nothing to do with it. There's not necessarily a correlation between how rich, poor, or how broken your family is and your mental health. I mean, those things don't necessarily help your mental health, but there's not necessarily a correlation between those things. Which is, you know, so vital for me to hear and everyone to hear. And, and, and let's, let's, you know, repeat that. There's not a direct correlation between what kids, disadvantages kids may have, what they may suffer from, their, you know, economic placement, or wherever that falls, to mental depression correct you will find that you know if once you find out a child has an issue the ability to get help isn't always there from disadvantaged homes but the fact that they got there it doesn't necessarily correlate to how much money you have or how much how much you love your kids yeah and really you know i'm thinking all right well there's got to be warning signs you know threats of, of all this but and maybe now you look back and, and you realize there were that you know our generation is oblivious to i, I don't know but they, 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 there's not necessarily warning signs there's not like you know i have 15 days before i make a, a decision like this i, I assume well there, there, there are, you look at if you if you are paying attention and you're having the conversations then there are warning signs i wasn't because i didn't think i needed to so when I look back on things, yeah, Ryan was becoming more withdrawn into his, his teenage years, which I, what I thought was his teenage years, right? Right. And I thought, well, he's just being grumpy. He's turning 14. He's going through puberty. He's, just, you know, he's not sure he likes this. He's going to high school next year. He's a little nervous about that. But I believe that I had a great co relationship with Ryan because we would you know, go down every night and watch you know, a movie and or TV show after dinner, and we'd eat dinner together, and you know we... You know, it's, it's crazy as it sounds like we, we as a family kind of wrote this book called Dinner Conversations that you don't need to go by. But it was just kind of like all the funny conversations we had at dinner. How old is that book? That book came out in 2017. Wow. In the fall. Ryan actually, because we would have dinner and, and this is the kind of family. Like, the whole point behind this book was have dinner with your kids leave the phones over there and have the conversations and the fun conversations. So we would have these dinner every night when I was home and I traveled a fair bit, but when yeah. I was home, dinner was a, not like a 20 minute thing. Dinner's like a two hour deal or not, at least 90 minutes where we're sitting down telling funny stories and we pick the funniest story of the night. And that would become the dinner conversation that I would post on Facebook. And then we all watched to see who would like the, the like it the most or the comments people would make. 
And comments came, well, you need to turn this into a book. So the summer of 2017, Ryan actually grabbed all of the Facebook posts off of Facebook and we turned it into a book and published the book as a way to help parents understand that you need to have conversations and not just have the TV on and iPads at dinner. And that's the irony of this whole thing, right? I wrote a parenting book a year before my son died with him, which makes me crazier. So you think that you might have a great conversation, thought with your kids, but Ryan hid it. Ryan's outward appearance to the world was not his inward feelings. And I didn't know enough to ask him the questions of how he was really doing. He'd have a bad day at school or he'd be in his room or he'd be grumpy and say, you want to come do, go on a run errands? So I'd be no, I want to do that. I'd be like, all right, because you know what? You're in a bad mood. I don't want you with me anyway. <laughs> but I want you reading my Saturday. Whereas I should have dove in and said, what the hell's going on? Because, John, we're the, pretty much the same age. We grew up where no one asked those questions. No one, it's like we just, you just deal with your stuff. Right. But something has changed. I'm not sure exactly what has completely changed. But it's not like we grew up. And that's the mistake that I think parents make now. It's like, I grew up, my parents didn't ask me these questions. They didn't care about this stuff. So why do I need to care about it? Well, the world's completely different now. When you take a look at when you and I grew up, you know, I, I grew up in Canada with, you know, two or three TV channels. You know, we watched Get Smart and Gilligan's Island. There's nothing else to watch. And you go outside and you play until it gets dark. You come back for dinner, right? And that's all those stories about us riding our bicycles around until the, the streetlights came on was real. That was what we did. Yeah. But we didn't watch the news. We didn't know what was going on in the world. There were things like, if, if John, if you think back to being 13, what was the big worldwide crisis when you were 13 oh uh, maybe reagan getting shot i i you know i you know there was you know i i, I have no clue yeah I, I mean maybe there was but my head was in the sand you know i it was about you know the my biggest crisis was that you know joanna wasn't didn't like me anymore and and you know that was that was the extent of my world was just in front of me does joanna still not like you uh yeah well, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. She hasn't, she won't friend me or accept any of my friend requests. So. Have you tried being more of a stalker? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, the, the, the um, restraining order is, is coming up. Well, you know, you, you'll work through it. You always do. <laughs> <laughs> not your first. <laughs> it won't <Right>. be lots. <laughs> no, but like the reality is, if you take a look at 10 and 11 year old kids now, and you ask them 20 years from now, what was it like growing up during COVID? They know. Yeah. They'll remember. Because they're dealing with it now. Because it's in the news. Because they see it all the time. These kids are growing up with this, this feeling like the world might end in 20 years. So what, what does it matter if I'm here or not? Because all the stuff we're doing to the environment means that we're not going to have a place to live anyway. Because California is going to be flooded and all the, all the seashores are going to be flooded. And the world's going to burn down. Now, whether you believe that or not is not my issue today. My issue is that the kids are in nine years of age need to worry about that. And they do. They're worried about the war on Ukraine. They're worried about nuclear war. And we, we, like, we, we grew up in a time when nuclear war was an option. And all we knew was that get under your desk. If they say get under your desk, we didn't, there was nothing to study. There's nothing to watch on the internet. There was no internet. It was yeah, like, there was oh. no feeding the fear. There was yeah. none of that. You, you said something on, on, on one of your TED Talks that really hit home. You said when we were kids, the being picked on or bullying stopped at, you know, 3 p.m., right? Mm -hmm. Then you got to go home and be with your, you know, your, your, your neighbors, your, your friends from the neighborhood or, or your family, and which was a safe, typically safe, hopefully a safe environment that was nurtured and, and all that. But today that bullying can go on 24 seven. And that was really an eye opener to me. And it, and it's, and it's true though, right? Because you, everybody can be a jerk with a keyboard and these kids are seeing this every single day. And it's not just kids, like it's adults, right? I mean, we're all suffering from it. I have an incident yesterday. Like I do these kind of talks all the time. I've never had anyone come up and challenge me saying I'm absolutely wrong. You don't know what you're talking about because I have a fair idea of what I'm talking about. 
Yesterday, I had a group of 80 people on a Zoom call. And in the chat box was where all the questions, and they're all like, hey, what about this? Thank you for this. And the normal stuff I would see, right? This one lady, this is all wrong. How can you put this? I'm, I'm like, I'm watching this going, what? where is this coming from? And it just kept going and going and going. It was like, I'm, 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 I'm like, what is going on here? I finally said, look, it, I see all your comments. Thank you. Here's my email address. Send me an email. I'm happy to talk with you. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, that's fine. But like, what does she have a background? This she apparently she doesn't. She has yeah. an opinion. The theory versus firsthand experience. Yeah. But that's like me as a fifty-five-year-old man who's a, you know me, John. I'm a pretty tough guy, and I'm still going. Yeah. What the hell is going on here? And that's the world we now live in: is that anybody gets to criticize us publicly, and can go after our kids publicly, and how do they feel? If I can get upset. What's a 10 year old kid feel? Yeah. We yeah. didn't have that. You're listening to the Customer Service Revolution podcast. You've probably read all of John's books, so you're obviously passionate about the customer experience. Have you ever considered a career as a customer experience coach? The DeJulius Group can train and license you in the same methodology that our consultants use. It's the same framework that's being used in companies like Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, Nestle, and the Ritz-Carlton's. Our Coach Camp gives you the tools to start your own business as a CX coach. If you're ready to invest in your future and build a business around your passion for the customer experience, contact Claudia at thedejuliusgroup.com or visit cxcoaching.com no no i don't remember having the pressures you know and i don't you know, you know i don't even know if i agree with you know everyone likes to blame the the next generations after us on, they all got participation trophies right and that made them soft i i don't know and 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 you know i don't know if anybody knows where it comes from i, I definitely know social media is not a, a healthy vehicle for anyone. It may be in moderation, but certainly not kids, but you would know more than that, I'm sure, besides your own experiences. I know you're doing a lot of research in this now. Yeah, I mean, I look at it, I'm not an expert. I don't have a degree in this stuff. I spent the last four and a half years diving deep into it every single week, which is not a place anybody really wants to live, but that's where I am living. And so I have, I have things that I've learned. And yeah, social media is not great for kids. I don't think it's great for adults. No, no. I mean, if I'm on it too long enough, it's it's called doom scrolling. And also now I'm going to be like, oh, my God, we are. The world is ending. You know, the politics is horrible. Conspiracy theories. Is, is, is COVID real? You know, it's just, you know, you don't need that. Whatever you want to believe, you can find someone on the Internet is going to back right. up your right? And, right. and we all have those friends that you go, know, the conspiracy theorists, like, the world is going to end because of this, 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 and this. And they can tell you, take you through all the videos you should watch. They'll make you possibly believe that. I, I don't subscribe to that. But look at, we're adults. How how the kids feel? Like, what are they going to go down? What path do they go down? And then they see everybody else's life that looks better than theirs. You know, they're on, they're <laughs> just like a lot of us on Zoom or on, on Facebook looking at somebody else in their yacht going, I don't have a yacht. Right. Right. It's like. Maybe I want a yacht. Why does that person have a yacht? I don't have a yacht. Why does that person have a big plane? I don't have a big plane. Right, they have a right. bigger house than I do. Why don't I have that bigger house? Why? My life sucks. Well, for us, if we're going through that, kids are going through it worse. So, I mean, the real question is like, so what do you do? Right, right. Right? Because uh, you can say that, okay, so Ryan was more withdrawn. His grades were slipping. He was more snappy at the dinner table, not as involved with the family as he used to be. You're describing every teenager in America, or at least a lot of them, all, all three of my boys are like that or have been like that during that same age. So, it, you know, it, it's it's. Well, and you know what? In most cases, that's just is what it is. They're grumpy. Right. But in some cases, they're not. And the real struggle for parents is how do you figure out whether they are or they aren't? Jay, what's that look like? What should we be? What's the question we should be asking? What's the signs we should be looking for? Well, the signs are the signs we just, we just talked about, right? It's a chain. They change. 
I mean, they, they, they are not who they used to be. And nice. do not assume that just because your kid is captain of the football team that there's depression will never hit them because I have talked to too many parents of captains of football teams that lost their kids or the, the head cheerleader or the head this or the head that or the kid who had all the friends. 4.0. 4.0, this, that, the other thing. I've talked to way too many of them. So do not assume that just because your kid outwardly looks great, if they're changing, you need to have the conversation. And I would just suggest that you take the time to talk about mental health with your kids the way you talk about your physical health, physical health with your kids. So here's my message, right? Because I can't change the world. And I don't like talking about suicide because suicide is the end of this whole thing. I like talking about depression, and anxiety, substance abuse, eating disorders. Why? Because that's affecting 35 to 45% of the kids out there today. That they have actual feelings of real depression, real anxiety, eating disorders, or substance abuse. Actually, if you add them all up, it's higher. They're self-medicating with alcohol, even differently than you and I going out and having some beers on a Saturday night when we were, we were teenagers. This is like a lot more, it's a deeper form of self-medication, right? So I like talking about all that because Suicide, when we're, getting, when we're having a conversation about suicide, that's the end game that we missed everything. Right. And if you have someone who's, who's living in depression, that's a crappy way for anybody to live. And people live that way for long periods of their lives. I want us to change that part. Right. And if we change that part up front, then we can get away from the whole suicide thing. But what it comes down to is owning your child's mental health you, the way you own their physical health. Like if, if one of your boys has a stomach ache when they were young, I know they're, they're older now, right? So you won't hear about it as much. But let's just say they're 12, 13, 14 years of age and they have a stomach ache. The first thing you go is Monday morning going, really, dude? Right. You got a stomach ache? Are you faking it? You don't want to go to school? What's going on at school today? Why don't you want to go to school? Okay, maybe it's real. Oh, crap, you got a fever. Okay, you got a fever. You got to stay home. I'm going to rearrange my day. Let's stay home today. But then the fever's still there. Pain's still there. Whoops. Let's call the doctor. Let's see what's going on. Let's make sure that's not a pet. Where's that hurt? We're wired to do all that stuff as parents. That's normal. Every parent. And it always starts with, are you faking it? All good. Right? Sure, it hurts. Tell me why it hurts. You got a headache? You always have a headache. We all do that, but we, but we work through it. And when it's serious, we jump on it, right? What we don't do is own their mental health the same way. They come home and say, I broke up with my girlfriend and I don't, I just, it's my life is, I can't see forward. It's it sucked. I just, and what do we say? We say, dude, it's your first girlfriend. You know how many girls are out there? You know how many girls you're going to be with before you, like, the, I didn't even like her. <laughs> no, I, listen, I've said it too. I, I'll be like, are you kidding me? It's been a month. Like, think about people who've been married 15 years and get a divorce, and you feel bad for you? And, and Jay, we, we grew up where saying that to our parents was was taboo. It, it, we were, we, it was a weakness, you know, all that. And whether we had those thoughts, I mean, we were always, you know, I'm sure we were bummed. Me and you share that we have been fortunate not to have uh, suffered from depression, but there's there's negative side effects to that, that we are we don't recognize when other people do, because we kind of think everyone, or I, I think everyone operates like me. And it, should they come to it? Should it be an employee or anyone? My old thing was, are you kidding me? This is what you're complaining about? You want great, you know, open the news. There's, you know, 50,000 sexual abuses a day. There's, you know, I give them all these statistics, which totally invalidates what they're, you know, and it was totally wrong. And I do that with my kids. Like, really? This is, you know, look at the house we live in. Look what you, you get to do. Like, are you kidding me? And uh, you don't, you know, when I was like, when I was a kid, I had it 10 times worse, which is, I'm sure, everything wrong to do. But that's how we're wired, right? Because for problem solvers going, what the hell, dude? This is not a big deal. Like people come to you and I all day long in a lot, in a lot of your audience with, here's my problem. How do I solve it? That's all I get. I mean, look, I coach CEOs. I own companies. No one calls me up with, Jay, this is awesome. They call me up. I got a problem. Okay. Right. Stand in line. Right. 
what, what do I do here? I'm like, great, here's what I want you to do. But with our kids, the thing that we have to realize, which was really hard, and I wish I understood it earlier, and I'll give you this analogy I use now because I think it helps people see it, is like, I live in Southern California. I can look outside right now, and nine times out of ten, there's not a cloud in the sky when I look outside my window. It's just blue sky. It's beautiful. If I was standing here looking at that window with somebody who's depressed, all they're going to see is clouds. We're looking at the same sky. All they're going to see is clouds. There's nothing I can do, John. There's nothing I can say, John. There's nothing you can say that's going to change their mind that there's no clouds in the sky. And this is the thing that's hard for people to understand. It's like, is that a Jesus, disease, don't... Jay? It's a disease, right? Depression's a disease? Yes. And so my weakness, I, I, I've had in my family, immediate family, depression and addiction. Again, to your point, I thought the best way to handle it was to be a prosecuting attorney to, to prove, show me a cloud. Show me where a cloud is. You cannot point one to me. Therefore, I'm changing your mindset. Right. And it, it, I failed every time at that. Yeah, because what, what, what ends up happening, John, when you do that? Oh, they, 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 they stop telling me they, they, you know, and now I'm not, they're not gonna, I'm not going to be someone they come to. Yeah. And, 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 and by the way, I did the same stuff, right? I had to go through what I went through to understand now that that's not how it works. They are not seeing the world through the same lens that I'm seeing it through and you're seeing it through because they have a disease because they're sick. So they see clouds. And to them, those clouds are absolutely 100% real. To your kid who just broke up with his girlfriend or his, her boyfriend, that is the biggest, baddest, worst thing on the planet. They don't know how to move forward. And you're like, what the hell? But all you can do when you have that person who sees clouds is to get them to talk about their clouds. And you just got to ask them. And, and I know it makes no sense. It's not supposed to. But just tell me about your clouds. What do they look like? Are they there all the time? What makes them come and go? How do they make you feel? Don't try to talk them out of that the, the, uh, the clouds aren't real. Nope. Just find if out. You, the minute you say those clouds are not real, you've lost them, John. You've lost them. They will never come back to you and have a serious conversation again with you, likely. Maybe they will. Most likely they won't. Because they go, you don't understand me. And I'm going to put you in that bucket of other people that don't understand me. What you want to be is the person who says... Just tell me about all of it. And then bite your tongue every time you want to say, hey, but they're – just bite your tongue. Go, this person is making no sense. There's, there's not a person standing in the corner of the room that I can see. You won't see the person standing in the corner of the room, John. They do. And that's not that bad for everybody, but for some of us. Right, 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 right. But the – I, my world is crushed, is crushed around me is their world. All you can do is get them to talk about their world. Because if you think about what a therapist does, and this is where I get controversial because I say to people, I want you to be a child's therapist. And they're like, I'm not a therapist. I'm not trained. And the therapist goes, you're not trained to be a therapist. I'm like, okay, what's a therapist do? They get you to talk about your feelings. They ask you questions. They don't judge you. They don't try to fix you. They get you to talk about your feelings because as you talk about your feelings, it's like this pressure cooker and you're relieving the pressure and all of a sudden you're feeling better. They need to know that they can go and talk to you as their parent, as their spouse, and you're not going to judge them. You're not going to tell them a damn thing besides listen to them and tell me love. Yeah. And it's hard. For people like us and, and, and you know, who, who just want to fix everything. Yeah. Excuse we're me. Problem, very, like very you said, we're problem solvers. And, and I don't, I, I've always struggled with people venting. If you're stuck in traffic all day, every day, well, take a different route, leave a different time of the day and problem solved. Yep. And that's how you and I roll with the world. And that's fine. But people you don't want to, they, they just want to vent and say, I had a shit drive home or shit drive to work. And you know, I always want to make it better. And it's the hardest thing for me to realize is they're not looking for solutions. They just want to oh, get it off their chest. Okay, but John, I think they're – okay, so I want to differentiate because this is the tough part, right? I'm talking – I mean, if you take this all literally, you will let your kids rule the roost at home and you'll have no control over anything ever again. You have to really differentiate between someone who is really, truly – 
sad and upset and ill versus someone who's just going, I just want to whine about things for the sake of whining about things. And I'll give you a simple example, right? My son, Kyle, when we were growing up, or he was growing up, he was 13. Ryan would have been uh, 11 at the time. I have the kids work in the summer in the yards. And I remember I give him jobs. So Ryan was, Kyle was 13, he had to work 13 hours, be the bigger property. So his job was to cut roses for two hours, three hours a day in the summertime. And I would watch him from my office window. He had roses over here. He, he'd cut a rose. He had his water bottle over there. He cut a rose. He'd go get his water bottle. <laughs> he'd take a sip of his water. He'd walk back. He'd cut another rose. Then he had to go take a bathroom break. And all this, and this is what he did all summer long. And I'd get mad at him all summer long. And I'm like, dude, you got to work. I'm like, you're lazy. You got to work. You got to learn how to work. Why are you making me do this? You got to learn how to work. His 14th summer, he comes and goes, Dad, what am I going to do? What's my job for the summer? I'm like, oh, you're going to love this one. Here's a giant sledgehammer. Here's a small sledgehammer. Because what am I supposed to do with that? There's a pile of rocks over there. Break the big rocks and the small rocks. And there's your water ball. Don't let it move. It's right there. It's within reach. Why am I doing this? What are you doing with the rocks? Nothing. You're going to break them four hours a day all summer long. Why? Because you need to learn how to work. And, John, I don't regret doing that with Kyle. I regret making it only four hours a day instead of six hours a day. I should have made six hours a day because I'm not sure it had the same effect I wanted. It had some effect. Yeah. But I'm not saying don't be a parent. I'm not saying don't make them do their homework. I'm not saying don't make sure that they, they stick to the rules. I'm saying when you see the wheels coming off, have the thought to go, I need to just ask these questions. Like ask them how they're feeling. You've got to not be afraid to say, at its worst, how do you feel? And what does that look like? And tell me about it. Yeah. Have you ever thought about hurting yourself? Parents are scared to death to ask that question. And I can tell you that the whole idea of people or kids harming themselves and cutting themselves, is it's all over the place right now. Yeah. No, I listen. Two of my three boys that I know of have had what, I, you know, I've just learned suicide ideation. You might be able to explain that a hell of a lot better than I can, but they'll, they'll picture it. Yeah. And you need to, and, and that's, and so before everybody gets freaked out because they thought their kids have thought about killing themselves, lots of kids think about killing themselves. And if they bring it up to you and you're lucky enough that they feel close enough to you to even bring it up to you, and you should feel lucky that they brought it up to you because they feel that they love you and they can trust you. You just got to ask them, like, have you ever thought about doing this? And if, and they say, yeah, I thought about it. Do you have a plan on how you were going to do it? Yeah, I was gonna. I'm saving pills from your from the medicine cabinet, or I, I've got this, or I've got that. Like, well, that's when they need to get some serious help, right? Because and that's when you need to bring them to a doctor right away, because that's that's serious. If they don't have a plan. They're just like any other kid who's thinking that my life sucks and maybe I'd be better off dead. And then you just have to keep talking. So, so open communication, constant open constant. communication. Because, you know, I, I've had my kids, you know, like, like you said, they went through that. They, they lost their mother. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so they've struggled and 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 they've struggled with depression. And, and so, but I'll think, oh, they're good now, right? They've been happy the last couple of days, you know, and I'll completely forget. And I think, oh, you know, because that's how me and you are. We, we moved on, not from. Uh, no, no, from, I, no yeah, kind of good. right, right, right. And then I'll forget, and then I'll get blindsided by it three months later that they've been struggling, and I'm like, "Oh, I thought that was, I thought we 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 took care of we that. We checked the box on that. <laughs> we talked. <laughs> what do you mean we did that? We, I, that was last year. I was like, <laughs> right. I'm yelling less. I thought you know that was the problem. You know, and so I think you know this this open communication is, is critical. Well, and, and look at it also is the vulnerability. It's like when you take a look at your life and my life, like you are a big personality. You're a big public personality. And it's easy for your kids to look at you and go, I'll never measure up to my dad. And when I showed up to my kids, I showed up as a guy who, you know, built businesses. I was an Iron Man. I coached CEOs. I blah, 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 blah. My kids never saw me cry. Ryan never saw me cry. At the meanwhile, behind that, I failed at 14 or 15 businesses. I almost lost the house a couple of times, never told my wife, never told my kids. 
I had massive issues financially that I never told anybody, but I just worked through them all and we had a big smile on my face. Well, when Ryan had his problems, what did he, what did he think? He, well, dad never has a problem. Dad's life is great. He solves all his problems. It must be me. Something's wrong with me because, you know, dad's never had a speed bump in his life, let alone a failure. So yeah. he thinks. So he thinks. Dad's so let me, let me ask you this. You know, I love, and, and that's well, that's why I knew really, it, it, you know, now that you're reminding me of those Facebook posts in the book that you wrote, Dinner Conversation. Dinner Conversation. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that. Maybe the conversation should look a little different, right? You know, instead of, you know, I don't know, what we, what, what would you recommend those dinner conversations to make sure, you know, we're not missing the suppression, people suppressing it or us ignoring it? Would you change anything about those dinner well, conversations? I, I think it's not so much about the public conversations at dinners and maybe the private conversations one-on-one. -on -one. It's like, you know, going for I – mean, how do you talk to your kids? I, you don't talk to them by running in their room and saying, we need to talk right now. That never works. They're going to tell you that whatever, screw off, and, and you get in a fight, and we've all done it, right? That's their own private little space. Let them have that space. The time to talk to your kids is when it's most inconvenient to you because they want to talk. And John, you know what I'm talking about. It's the times like, especially boys, like they, all of a sudden they're just talkative. It happens like once on a lunar moon, whatever the hell it is, right? But they're talking of all that time. Maybe they're talking when you take them to school, maybe they're talking when you, whatever it's going to be, but they're talking. Like you just got to lean in on that time. Right. And, 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 you know, I know as you bring that up, it's like, Wow, he's chatty, but I'm a little consumed right now with my problem, or I got to get to work, or I got to call that client back, and so I'm maybe I'm <laughs> not taking advantage. You're not taking advantage, and it goes away, right? Of him saying, "Dad, code, Dad, I got some stuff. I, you know, I need to, you know, yeah, uh, Dad, I got a problem. Yeah, me too, busy. But if you can lean in on those times, and you can and you can start a conversation with, with somebody going like. You know, I had a crappy day at work today because somebody I don't like at work was treating me this way. And that happens to all of us. And I'm kind of frustrated and just want to share it with you. And you'll be surprised at that conversation with Alyssa's. I'm not saying, hey, hey, I just want to let you know I'm about to go bankrupt and I'm worried about that. I wouldn't go that far. Yeah, yeah. But I had a, I I had a tough schools. couple of things. Yeah. Someone did something to me and I just, I, I just kind of irritated. Right. I, I love that because maybe your son starts giving you advice. Yeah. You your know? son, your daughter. Right. I mean, right. You know, that, that happens to me. Well, how do you deal with it? Because I didn't deal with it too well. I let it bother me all day or I made it worse. I became the bully in the situation because I got angry and now I look like I was the bad guy, you know, whatever that may be. So, yeah. Yeah. So if I, if I bring this around to like, this is all the stuff that you can see and tell my story. You can see. That's what I want to get to. What, one thing before, because I do want to get to what you're doing now. Yeah. And I do. I, I want to make sure people aren't listening and saying, well, I don't have kids yet or my kids are all grown up because I think this applies to us as business leaders. And if we talked about employee well-being, it was never a leadership skill we were trained for or we ever had to worry about. And today... We have to worry about it as leaders, and 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 I think we should as leaders help our employees. And and sometimes that's recognizing that my you know number two person Eric is struggling, or he's not you know doesn't have that someone in his family is. And so there's a resource. It doesn't mean we have to be the therapist, but there's a resource to teach our employees who may be going through it directly or indirectly someone in their family is going through it. So I, I feel that it, it, it's now a, a major part of our responsibility and it should be. Do you agree? Well, Do I have that right? I 100% I agree. Let me tell you what we're working on right now. My, my newest program is called What I Wish My Parents Knew. It's coming out in January now. The movie. It's, it's and we have movie. The, we, and, and it'll be at the link I'll provide. Tell my well, story. Here's the interesting thing about how I'm doing this. You're not okay. going to be able to find this movie on Amazon Prime or Netflix or anywhere else. This is a program that goes into schools and companies. So if I was going to go grab five kids and have them put them on a stage in an auditorium in front of parents and talk about what their mental health was like from growing up to where they are now, what worked, what didn't work, what they wish their parents knew, their friends knew, 
And I put them on that stage and we talked for 45 minutes. And then we brought on a mental health professional to work with the parents to talk about what they just saw. And then here's the local resources available. That's the program that this is. Now, I didn't find five kids. I interviewed 10 kids. And we have that crunched into 45 minutes of highlights that when you watch this, it's not a, we don't cut away. It's like the movie Tell My Story is a docudrama and you cut away to kids in the park and whatever it might be, right? But this is in a zoo, in a green screen studio with just watching these kids talk. And for 45 minutes, you're hearing their stories. You see me over here asking a question, but it's really focused on them. And hopefully you look at that and you say, okay, one of those kids can be my kid. It's meant to grab you and say, holy cow, I can see that in my child. I'm noticing that now. What am I going to do about it next? So this program goes into schools in January. We're hoping to get into 500 schools. And if you want to help or put in your school, uh, you can reach me at jason at tellmystory.org. That's jason at tellmystory.org. We will provide Jason's all your links, how to donate, how to get involved, how to bring this to your schools, community, and or businesses. I want, I want. Yeah, and from a business standpoint, John, because this is where you and I live, right? Look at as business owners and leaders, I can tell you right now, the stats aren't out, and I'm not sure how they're going to track it, but you're losing most of your time and productivity, not to COVID not to the flu, not to RSV, but to folks who are dealing with mental health issues, either their own, their wives, their spouses, or their kids. Because when you have a child who is threatening or cutting or depressed, you're not focused on what you're doing at work. And if you believe the stats, and I believe they're higher than what they project to be, around 40%, 40% of kids are dealing with massive depression, anxiety issues, which means 40% of the parents are. And that doesn't even count the parents and spouses who are dealing with it themselves. We have a massive issue on our hands as society, as business owners. And as business owners, I believe we should be doing more to share programs for people who work with us saying, 100%. Hey, here's 100%. what you can do. Here's where you can go get help. Because good, it's the right thing to do. And you're losing time and money because you're not doing it because you want people just to show up or I want people just to show up and do their job. You know, Jay, it's sad that we both feel the need to justify the ROI, right? You're, you're right, but screw the ROI. Yeah. It is the right thing. We, as leaders, we should be helping people live great lives, right? And, and whatever that means. And you know, and not just be efficient, more productive, profit-making things for us. But, you know, I, you know, that, that, you know, I'm, I know you feel that way. I feel that way. Yeah. I'm sure the, the bottom line or the, the employee turnover and all that will benefit us. But I don't care if, if a person leaves tomorrow, do they hit the lottery or they find a, a, a better job on paper? If I help them, you know, see these signs deal with them themselves, whatever that may look like, that, that's, that, I believe that's what our, our altruistic self should be. And we, you and I employ a lot, of a lot of people, and I want to make a difference in people's lives. Yeah. And then who they touch, right? And, and their, their communities. And, and you and I come in contact with a lot of clients who employ a lot of people, and it's just the ripple effect. And whether or not you want to use my program or somebody else's program, I really encourage all CEOs, all leaders to bring mental health programs into the workplace to help educate people on mental health. They need it. People know, the vast majority of people don't understand the difference between a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and a therapist. If your child gets 5150 or your spouse gets 5150 in the hospital for 72 hours, nobody knows, to do, knows what to do about it. We're building up programs when, when they get taken to the hospital for 72 hours because they were suicidal. Yeah. Right now, they send you home with a couple of pieces of paper saying, here, hide the pills, hide the knives, and call 988 if there's a problem. Yeah. And again, if this any part of this has triggered anybody and you feel and you're struggling, struggling please call 988 and, and talk. To, someone will be there to help you and talk you through anything you might be feeling right now. I hope... This has given people a few things to think about, to look at differently. 
John and I could probably talk for hours about this. I know I do all the time. No, Jay, I thank you. You uh, unvoluntarily have become one of the major poster people for this. It's the last thing you wanted to be. I hope it, it, it in a way it's therapeutic in a way, but you could have, like, I think I would just go in the fetal position and, and, and never want to talk about this again because of the uh, memories and the wounds it has to uh, revisit, but you're doing that to yourself. So it could change a lot of uh, future people's lives. Like always, Jay, you, you impress the hell out of me in so many ways. I appreciate you and, and I have no problem saying this. I, I, I love you as a friend. I love you too, buddy. And, and I, everything you've been through, we've been through our own journeys and you've done an amazing, amazing job with those boys and yourself. Thank you, Jay. And I will provide all Jay's links, his website, how you could uh, follow him, tellmystory.org, um, how you could bring this into any of your worlds, which I think is critical today in business in family and in schools. Thank you, Jay, so much. Uh, thank, thank you, you Revolutionaries, for another episode of the Customer Service Revolution podcast. And we will see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening in to this episode of the Customer Service Revolution podcast. I'm Denise Thompson, Managing Partner of the DeJulius Group, and I invite you to send us your questions, post a review, and let us know what you liked and want to hear more of. We're happy that you're part of the customer service revolution and encourage you to subscribe now so you don't miss an episode. You'll find us on Spotify, iTunes, or your favorite podcast station. 